Xi Jinping, the leader of China, is arguably one of the most important men on the planet. With his strong grip on the Chinese Communist Party as the paramount leader, he rules over more than 1.4 billion people. But as powerful as he is, he won't stay at the top forever. At some point, he will retire, be forced to step down due to his health, or he could pass away while in office. Keep in mind, Xi Jinping is already 71 years old. If it wasn't the case that Joe Biden and Donald Trump are older, you might think that's a relatively high age for a world leader. Anyways, the point is that we will see a transition of power within the coming years. It can be 5 years, 10 years, or even 20 years, no one really knows. What we do know is that this transition of power will be a defining moment in Chinese history. Because Xi Jinping has named no clear successor, it's bound to go wrong. Xi Jinping has eliminated all of his political opponents, so there's no one left with good leadership qualities. In the power vacuum that follows, the divisions within the CCP will become apparent. The worst-case scenarios are infighting within the party, a coup d'etat, or even a civil war. In this video, we will look at one of the biggest problems Xi has created, namely his successor issue, China's political battleground. First of all, we need to understand how China's political system has worked in the past. Before the Xi Jinping era, the paramount leader wasn't as powerful as today. This position includes the most important roles in the country, namely the presidency of the government, the general secretary of the CCP, and the chairman of the Central Military Commission. But there used to be something preventing a one-man dictatorship, namely a level of internal competition within the Chinese Communist Party. The CCP used to be way more complex than people realize, with a wide range of political factions. This diversity existed because of the sheer size of the legislative system. The Politburo has 24 members, which forms the head of the central committees, with 205 members. They carry out the party's decisions and policies in between meetings of the so-called National People's Congress. The National People's Congress is even larger, comprising 2,977 members. In fact, it's the largest legislative body in the world. And that's not even all. You also have important positions in the government, which is technically a separate organization, but tightly controlled by the CCP. Obviously, the people in China's military have power too. On top of that, there are many elite leaders on a provincial level. The point of all this is that the paramount leader was in a different position before Xi Jinping radically changed the game. The leader needed support from many political factions to have a stable grip on power. We can see this back in the history of China's succession politics. If we set aside the shaky period after Mao Zedong died, successions followed a largely similar playbook. The paramount leader chose a loyal successor who's popular within the party. By slowly placing them in higher and higher positions, everyone knew who it would be. Because the successor had time to present himself, make contacts, and prepare for his new position, chaos was limited. This informal system led to somewhat regular and peaceful transfers of power within the CCP. The first voluntary transfer of power was from Deng Xiaoping to Jiang Zemin in 1989. Deng had created the unwritten rule that a paramount leader would step down after around two five-year terms. This showed in the next transfer of power, namely that of Jiang Zemin to Hu Jintao. Jiang didn't trust his successor enough to give all positions away at once, and he took two years to fully leave. Hu Jintao became the general secretary in 2002, the president in 2003, and the chairman of the Central Military Commission in 2004. Even after this time, Jiang remained an influential politician due to his network. Still, the transfer was pretty unremarkable, as Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao were from different political factions. It seemed to go even better in the next transfer of power. That was from Hu Jintao to Xi Jinping in 2012. In 2007, Xi Jinping was already named as his successor, which made the transfer of power five years later very smooth. In fact, it was the first transfer of power without any real hiccups, as Hu Jintao gave up all his three roles at once. Little did people know, it would be the last one. In a second, we'll get into how Xi consolidated all the power. Right now, let's quickly talk about new changes to YouTube. I'm sure some of you guys have noticed that whenever you go to your homepage on YouTube, you get some videos recommended from channels that are extremely new. Here's an example. This change is relatively new, 
and it actually provides a perfect opportunity for new channels to get started and grow quickly. In fact, many channels have used this exact thing to grow an audience in the last 12 months. They've gotten millions of views and made thousands of dollars from them. In fact, in just the last three years, YouTube has paid out $70 billion to creators. That's around $60 million every single day. So, if you're someone who's interested in starting a YouTube channel, right now is the perfect time. That's why we've launched a completely free 7-day email crash course on how to start and grow a faceless YouTube channel. If that's something you're interested in, you can sign up now for free by clicking the link in the description or scanning the QR code on screen. Now, let's get back to Xi's power grab. When Xi Jinping started his career, the public and the CCP members expected to see a liberal leader and even more stability within the CCP. But that couldn't be further from the truth. People discovered who Xi Jinping really was immediately after he took office. The watershed moment was when he started his infamous anti-corruption campaign. Z went after quote-unquote tigers as well as flies, meaning people on the highest and lowest levels of government. Corruption was defined very loosely as it included financial misconduct as well as violating state law or party discipline. Now, you have to understand that corruption was and still is very widespread in China. Taking bribes is normal business for CCP politicians. Cracking down on this issue made Xi Jinping very popular in the public eye. Yet, this wasn't the only or even the main reason Xi decided to tackle corruption. In reality, it was a way for him to consolidate power. Everyone in the party knew that Xi Jinping had the power to destroy their political career and even put them in prison. As of 2023, 120 people in the highest places of government and 2.3 million government officials in total have suffered this fate. Maybe they deserve this, maybe not. Because corruption is so common in the CCP, C has dirt on a lot of people. But even innocent people could be charged as China's judicial system isn't independent and the exact boundaries of violating party discipline are pretty vague. From 2013 onwards, Xi Jinping used this campaign to hunt down his enemies within the CCP and convince the rest to be extremely loyal to him. One of the first victims was Bo Xi Lai. He was a very popular CCP politician serving on the Politburo, but corruption allegations were his downfall. He got life imprisonment for bribery despite denying all charges. The court case was highly publicized as a landmark in Xi's anti-corruption campaign. We can't rule out a political motivation here because Bo Xi Lai was a potential rival. The same goes for Sun Sheng Kai, who was arrested in 2017 and sentenced to life imprisonment one year later. He was a rising star in the CCP and thus a potential danger to Xi's one-man rule. This was despite Sun Sheng Kai not openly criticizing Xi in any way. Apart from these two men, there are dozens of other victims. Members of the Jiang Zemin-related Shanghai clique and the Hu Jintao-related Youth League faction have also been charged, demoted, or replaced. Xi effectively removed any political leftovers from previous paramount leaders, solidifying his own position. What's also very telling is that many political elites voluntarily left China. People related to the PRC's founders, commonly referred to as princelings, have settled in the Los Angeles area in exile. This is a sign that they're afraid of Xi and his anti-corruption campaign. What strengthened Xi Jinping's grip on power even more was his personality cult. Xi isn't treated like a deity similar to Mao Zedong, but he has given himself a special status. In 2016, he designated himself as the core of the Central Committee. Later, in 2019, he introduced the two safeguards. This calls for all party members to secure Xi Jinping's position as the core and the unrivaled leadership of the Central Committee. With these rules, going against Xi Jinping on any matter is the same as going against the party itself, which is illegal. In this way, he has the absolute loyalty of all politicians. The same can be said about Xi's inner circle of friends, which helps him stay in power. The way CCP politics work is that powerful people give their friends high positions to create their own political faction. Xi Jinping is no exception, as he has done it better than anyone else. Some of the friends he made back when he served in the Zhejiang province are now in the highest places of government. This includes the Politburo Standing Committee members Li Chiang, Kai Qi, and Li Zhi. 
The accumulation of all his efforts of consolidation came at the annual meeting of the National People's Congress in 2018. He suddenly announced that he wanted to remove the term limits for the presidency. Out of fear of prosecution, the members of the Congress voted in favor of this legislative change. A former high-ranking CCP member and political professor Kai Chia had much to say about this. According to her, he forced everyone at the plenum to swallow the revision like he was stuffing dog shit down their throats. And she also noted that not one dared to raise this issue. Another key moment that deserves to be mentioned is when Xi Jinping publicly humiliated his predecessor. During the National Congress of the CCP in 2022, former Paramount leader Hu Jintao was forcefully removed. This happened right in front of all the media, and it was clear that Xi Jinping gave the order for this. It sent quite a chilling message about who's in charge. In the same Congress, Xi Jinping removed his last potential political opposition. Li Keqiang and Wang Yang were demoted from the Politburo Standing Committee, and the up-and-coming politician Hu Chunhua was removed from the Politburo. They were all members of the Youth League faction related to Hu Jintao. In one sweep, he removed all the political influence Hu Jintao had left. Xi's succession problem Although it was highly successful, Xi's power grab came at a cost. It completely destroyed the peaceful transfer of power because there's really no plan for who will come after Xi Jinping. History tells us that this is a common phenomenon. According to the academic Myron Rush, in any personal dictatorship or tyranny, one thing is certain. Someday, there will be a succession crisis. He wrote this about the former Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which shares many similarities with the CCP. So, why is this succession dilemma such a big deal? Well, there are three problems for dictators and for Xi in particular. The biggest issue of all is that he has a lot of enemies. During his anti-corruption campaign, Xi Jinping angered hundreds if not thousands of high-ranking officials. If Xi lets go of power and these people manage to take over the government, he has a big problem on his hands. He and his family might end up being prosecuted, jailed, or even worse. So, Xi needs a successor who's extremely loyal to him and competent enough that he can weather the inevitable opposition. The CCP leader has an inner circle he can trust, but there's a second problem. The people he keeps close are terrible picks for successors. In the history of Paramount leaders, most have had a very wide portfolio before they got the top job. This includes positions on the provincial level, in the military, and in various party organs. This gives them the necessary political skills, connections, and credibility. The problem for C is that there's no one in his inner circle with such a wide governing portfolio. And that didn't happen by accident. Xi Jinping hasn't given anyone the room for it, perhaps because he's too afraid to do so. After all, someone powerful enough to succeed Xi is also powerful enough to be a threat to his rule. He didn't remove all the runners-up during the anti-corruption campaign for no reason, so he won't create one either. Another dangerous aspect of preparing a successor is that it might anger some people. Politicians that don't like Xi's pick could turn against the leader with dangerous consequences. In short, there are a lot of problems with Xi Jinping's succession, which leaves us guessing at China's future. Although it's impossible to say what will happen after Xi, it's worth looking at some different scenarios. The Center for Strategic and International Studies, combined with the Lowy Institute, actually made a report about this. It contains four different scenarios that might happen, although the first one is already outdated. Xi Jinping could have transferred his power back in 2022 when he was expected to step down after two five-year-long terms. This wouldn't make sense, though, as he removed the term limits to avoid this exact moment. And because of the reasons we discussed before, Xi doesn't really have someone to replace him at the moment. Scenario 2 is a transfer of power at the 21st or 22nd Party Congress in 2027 or 2032, respectively. This makes some sense because it gives Xi time to prepare a future candidate. And not unimportantly, all of his remaining rivals will have retired by then. The CCP will have a new generation of elite politicians, all of which have been approved and appointed by Xi. After Xi steps down, he can maintain informal power through his political connections, becoming some sort of kingmaker. 
Deng Xiaoping and Jiang Zemin have done this before, and it worked out for them. Xi Jinping can even keep one of his current positions as a safeguard, such as the PRC presidency or the head of the Central Military Commission. In this way, Xi can make sure that he and his family stay safe and that the power transfer goes smoothly. This scenario is not impossible, but it is more likely that Xi will cling on to power as long as he can. Generally, authoritarian leaders don't like to give up on their position. The words of British historian Lord Acton hold true, namely that absolute power corrupts absolutely. So let's move on to scenario three, namely that of a leadership challenge or a coup. There are more than enough people in China that don't like Xi Jinping, mostly because of his anti-corruption campaign and dictatorial traits. If these people get together, they can either oust him politically or militarily. Despite the potential support for this, though, there are some enormous challenges making this scenario the least likely one. Xi Jinping has created an internal spy network in China with the help of the National Supervisory Commission. He will likely know about any internal dissent before it even takes place because all communications are closely monitored. Any movement of resistance will have to start without any previous organization, which is incredibly hard. It can only happen if everyone believes Xi's position is weak, like during a failed conflict or an economic crisis. Then it comes down to an enormous bet by Xi Jinping's enemies. They can openly declare a resistance with two possible outcomes. Either they'll get arrested or they'll be successful if the majority of CCP members join them. However, this scenario is close to impossible because it depends on two big what-ifs. Lastly, we move on to the most likely scenario of all, unexpected death or incapacitation. This has happened to the likes of Stalin and Mao, who have clung on to power until the very last moment. Because of the rumors about Xi Jinping's health and his relatively old age, it won't be surprising if he passes away or gets seriously ill. A few things can happen if that's the case. People in his inner circle will likely try to take over control but their grip on power is very limited. This is because of a few sentences in the PRC and CCP constitutions about succession after sudden death. The positions of General Secretary of the CCP and the Chairman of the Central Military Commission will be elected by the Central Committee, and the President will be elected by the National People's Congress. This process is bound to be very chaotic. Not everyone within C's loyalist base wants the same successor. Top politicians like Li Qiang, Zhao Leiji, or Wang Huning all have something to say for themselves. The current vice president, Han Zheng, also has a chance. And there are undoubtedly scores of other ambitious CCP politicians that would want to fill the power vacuum. If these people start fighting each other, there's really no predicting what will happen next in China. One group could come out victorious and establish a new government. But in a moment of weakness, outsiders can also try to take advantage. People hurt by C's anti-corruption campaign could see the opportunity of their lifetime and try to come back. This includes the Shanghai clique and the Youth League faction. Although history doesn't always repeat itself, it's worth looking at what happened after Mao Zedong passed away. The situation was different from sudden death because Mao had been sick for years. This gave Mao time to choose a successor, namely Hua Guofeng. He did take over in 1976, but his reign didn't last long. Hua Guofeng was too weak to resist the opposition and was sidelined by Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping would have been one of the last picks by Mao. He was arrested during the Cultural Revolution because of his alleged capitalist ideas. When he came to power, he reversed many of Mao's policies and actually opened China up to the world. Maybe Xi Jinping's decisions will also be reversed and we can see a more liberal leader and a more decentralized China. There's also a possibility that it goes way different than it has in the past. The post-G crisis can be a black swan event where an anti-CCP movement rises to power. Some analysts think that the entire system will break down and that communist China won't be able to survive after C. In the end, who knows? All of these scenarios are incredibly uncertain and unpredictable because there are so many factors at play. Xi Jinping's own decisions will have a huge impact 
as did the decisions of his rivals and his allies. But one thing is for certain. The transition of power after Xi will be a historical turning point for China and the rest of the world. There's a very real chance that it will descend into chaos and instability. This is because Xi is unable or perhaps unwilling to prepare a successor with disastrous consequences. After the dust settles, we may see a very new China emerge both on a national level and internationally.